an underwater swim with a deep diving daredevil dog. Friends. Get inside a computerized car in France you can operate with the sound of your voice. Witness the spectacular development of aircraft carriers from early experiments to current operations. Take a tour with the New York artist who has transformed a car into a traveling art exhibit. Become a moving target for a photographer who keeps pigeons as working partners. Trigger a computerized weapon that fills the sky with a curtain of explosive steel. Share one of the world's most unusual and unsuccessful artistic statements. The strange, the bizarre, the unexpected. These are the kinds of subjects a man named Robert L. Ripley challenged us to. Believe it or not. In the world of art, there are those whose innovations, vision, and technique have set them apart from the ordinary painter or sculptor. The majority of people who attempt to become serious artists can achieve a certain proficiency, uh, such as seen in these sketches here, but lack the inspiration to become a master. The man who drew these sketches realized his limitations, gave up art, and went into another line of work. Later in life, although he became quite powerful, he never forgot his interest in art. He arranged to have an enormous number of works of the greatest artists of the 20th century shown in a single exhibition that, to this day, holds the record for attendance. The patron's name, the man who created these sketches, was Adolf Hitler. The show, which Hitler sponsored, opened in Munich in 1937. It was a typical example of vicious Nazi propaganda. Hitler called it the exhibition of degenerate art. The exhibit featured an enormous collection of paintings and sketches by artists like Picasso, Matisse, Van Gogh, Nolde, Beckmann, Gross, Clay, and Kandinsky. Hitler labeled the artists Stone Age culture vultures, whose work ran counter to the aims and spirit of the Third Reich. The exhibition was seen by over two million people. How many came out of curiosity to scoff or to take a last look at a disappearing art is impossible to determine. Crowds thronged halls to examine the artwork. The Nazis had confiscated all of it from public museums. To fatten the Nazi coffers, Hitler sold some of the pieces in foreign countries at cut-rate prices. The rest was reserved for a special fate. This purification of Nazi art reached a frenzied peak in March 1939, when almost 4,000 works of art were ritualistically burned in Berlin. Believe it or not. For an astronaut on board the space shuttle, television isn't just a casual form of entertainment. Often, it's the only way to see outside the craft while performing some vital procedure or experiment. But the astronaut usually has both hands full just working the controls that do the job. To solve that problem, 
Scientists here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, have developed a camera system that's voice operated. You just tell it what to do, and it does it. Pan right. Stop. Pan left. Stop. Tilt down. Stop. The camera doesn't respond to just anybody, by the way. It's programmed to listen to one specific voice only, in this case, mine. Otherwise, it could be distracted by somebody else on board and go veering off just as the astronaut was attempting some delicate piece of work. It seems simple. Actually, it's very complex. Although it depends on sophisticated technology, developing something like this doesn't necessarily require a team of scientists. In an ordinary home near Strasbourg, France, a 25-year-old student named Martine Kempf wanted to make voice control practical for ordinary use. Because she lacked any formal training in electronics, Martine had to teach herself as she worked. Her goal was to build a specialized computer system she called Catalavox. A, O, Alpha, A. To make it work, all she has to do is speak. A, Alpha, O, Catalavox. I invented the Cataravox, which is a device nobody else uh, invented. Maybe because just I didn't have class in electronic, so I never learned exactly how to build a computer. And I had just an idea, and I tried it, and it worked. A single Cataravox system can run many different appliances. Cataravox. Contrôlé. Radio. Allumé. A command signals a telephone to select and call pre-programmed numbers. Martine had a deeply personal reason for inventing cattle box. Polio had disabled her father. Using a throat microphone, he can control his motorized wheelchair. On right. Go ahead. On left. Go ahead. Go ahead. On right. On right. Catalavox can be programmed to recognize words from any language. The wheelchair recognizes English. The television responds to French. Catalavox. Catalavox. Televiseur. Antenne 2. Jean Souris. Quelle couleur est le cadeau que vous recevez Vert. Aber schon dem 10 jährigen sagt man. Vous allez faire maintenant Monsieur Kemp. Vous allez changer à nouveau qui, les chaînes. Cattle box can be used to operate almost anything, including a car. Instead of a key, Martine uses a code word to unlock and open the door. Aguero. Because this is her father's car, it will respond only to his voice. Martine must substitute a program recognizing her voice. 
the computer fits in the glove compartment where it is connected to the car's electronic system. Catalavox can recognize 50 different commands. The radio responds to French, German, and English. Everything in this car is designed to accommodate Martine's father, who cannot use his legs. Martine's father can brake and steer with hand controls. Everything else is voice activated. Drive. Second. Drive. End. This is not an experimental model. Cars like this, fitted with Martine Kemp's invention, are now sold throughout Europe. In Paris, Catalavox is helping people at the Rothschild Eye Hospital. Martine has been invited to witness the role of Catalavox in an operating room where doctors are using her invention while performing delicate microsurgery. Operating on an eye patient, the doctor looks through the microscope as she works. Instead of having to use a complex system of foot pedals, the surgeon can direct the microscope with her voice. Horizontal. The response is immediate and perfect. Vertical. Zoom. Focus. No, I never thought it will be such a big success as it is today. I just made it because the handicapped people need it and so I wanted to help them, that's all. And now I'm very surprised to see so, so many people want it for different other applications. Given her intelligence, skill and youth, there is no telling what else Martine Kempf might invent in the next few years. The teeth of a vampire bat are so razor sharp, it can bite into a sleeping victim without being detected. Believe it or not. This sign isn't quite the truth, but it's not entirely a joke either. This is the garden and home of Walter Allen here in Fountain Valley, California. Mr. Allen likes turtles. Well, he does more than just like them. He loves them. Since he retired about eight years ago, Mr. Allen has devoted almost every day to collecting and caring for over 400 turtles and tortoises. These pools were custom designed and especially built for the exclusive use of Mr. Allen's hard shell friends. The water temperature can be regulated so that the more exotic species can feel at home in their private pool. It even comes complete with a slide so that the slow moving turtle can take a quick dip. Keeping turtles as pets might not appeal to everyone, but Walter Allen has some very specific reasons why he prefers turtles to just about any other creature. 
I wanted to get into something that I could do when I retired and not be an old fuddy-duddy and sit in a rocking chair and watch soap operas and quiz programs all day long. And I got into turtles for two reasons. One, they don't make any noise. And two, they don't defecate much and smell up the neighborhood. And this way you can keep a lot of them. In a more traditional relationship between man and animal, a man named Gene Alba and a dog named Muttley have become a remarkable team. An otherwise ordinary pooch, Muttley has an unquenchable yen for adventure. Completely at ease on board Alba's motorcycle, Muttley is an eight-year-old sports enthusiast who enjoys having the wind in her teeth and new worlds to conquer. The mountains of Colorado and California provided the backdrop for one of Muttley's early accomplishments. She began skiing as a pup after she was outfitted with specially designed equipment. Alba worked at a ski resort when he and Muttley first met, and it seemed natural for her to join him on the slopes. In time, Alba was able to teach her the basics. After that, it was up to Muttley to push off on her own. Muttley's skills are the result of Alba's patience. Without any help from Alba, however, Muttley learned how to fall gracefully. Muttley took to the water as quickly as she did to the slopes. Alba designed custom scuba gear and over a period of months, trained her to swim at depths of 30 feet for as long as 25 minutes. Two admirers who pay for the privilege of watching her perform Muttley appears to be a wonder dog. And after 200 dives, perhaps she is. Muttley's remarkable skills would be impossible without two invaluable ingredients. Her confidence in Alba and his love for her. Of all the businesses in Jackson, Wyoming, there's one that's distinguished by a unique delivery service. Okay, guys. Photographer Rod Lewis makes his living with the help of a flock of homing pigeons. Without their assistance, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to do what he does. Rod Lewis has photographed such whitewater rafters for years. His experience has taught him where to be to get the kind of shots the rafters will want to buy. It takes him several hours to get there with all his equipment. But once in position, all he has to do is wait for the river to bring the customers into view. go by, Rod selects the first of the messengers he will send back home. The exposed roll of film is inserted into a special carrying pouch. 
Attached to the pigeon's breast, it is snug, lightweight, and easy to carry. Once it gets its bearing, Rod knows that the pigeon can make the 15-mile flight back to Jackson in about 25 minutes. Long before the rafters get back to town, the pigeons deliver their cargo to their roost. As they return, they trigger a signal in the processing laboratory below. The homing pigeons have a remarkable record. In three years, only one roll of film has been lost. Within hours of their adventure, the rafters return to discover the photographs that document the excitement of their achievement. As souvenirs, the pictures will be valued for years to come. Many purchasers, however, are unaware that the pictures that will grace their scrapbooks were delivered by airmail by Wyoming's only homing pigeon messenger service. A volcanic flow near Bend, Oregon, created a river of obsidian glass that is one and a half miles long. Believe it or not. This gadget is called a line marker. For sports events, it's used to lay out a playing field to establish what's in or out of bounds. The field I'm laying out, however, is not for a game. When I'm finished, it'll be the same size as the flight deck of the first experimental aircraft carrier of the United States Navy. The year was 1911. The flight deck was a wooden platform built on the bow of a cruiser. There were many experts who said that airplanes couldn't take off from the deck of a ship, and for good reason. For it to take off, a plane had to have a runway of considerable length, even in 1911. But one this size, about the length of four modern limousines parked end to end, proved that the idea of an aircraft carrier worked. The first flight deck was less than 30 yards long and about 8 yards wide. A landing strip that size could easily get lost on the massive deck of a modern aircraft carrier. From the air, however, the deck still seems small to jet pilots roaring in for a landing. Aircraft carriers are the most powerful weapon in the Navy's arsenal. At one time, battleships had that distinction. For a generation, their dominance of the sea was uncontested. As a result of their World War I experience, however, aviators became convinced that fragile airplanes would be more than a match for supposedly invulnerable battleships. Under the leadership of General Billy Mitchell, lightweight aircraft took on a heavy cargo. Some bombs weighed as much as two tons and would be used to attack a ship at sea. The target was a captured German ship, considered unsinkable by naval experts. The flight of the fledgling bombers was a test, which military observers fully expected to fail. The destructive potential of air power inspired naval engineers in England to transform a cruiser into an experimental aircraft carrier. The flight deck was a simple wooden platform. In the beginning, 
carrier launched planes had to reach the shore in order to land. Some did not make it. Early flight decks were simply installed on top of and around the superstructure of existing ships. The design created a problem for returning planes, some of which were equipped with skis instead of wheels. Floating airfields without any surface structures at all seemed to be large enough to handle incoming planes. Ramps and cables designed to slow them down, however, created as many problems as they solved. By risking their lives, pilots finally discovered an idea that worked. A hook designed to snag a cable. The hook didn't always work because it was installed near the front of the plane. When it was moved to the rear, it not only worked, it justified the creation of the first modern aircraft carriers. By the late 1930s, aircraft were specifically designed for carriers which now were equipped with elevators and below-deck maintenance and repair shops. By launching a carrier-based attack on December 7, 1941, the Japanese proved the awesome potential of air power at sea. It took almost two hours to reach the target, Pearl Harbor. When the surprise attack ended, every American battleship in the Pacific was either crippled or sunk. The targets the Japanese were really after, the American aircraft carriers, escaped simply because they were at sea. Soon, they became the most important weapon in the American counter-offensive. Control of the Pacific soon became an aerial contest. In the Battle of the Coral Sea, the opposing ships were never in sight of each other. The outcome depended almost entirely on air power. The battles raged across the Pacific, from the Coral Sea to Midway, from the Solomon and Marshall Islands to the Philippines. They were almost always fought in the air and almost always ended in victory for the American forces. American pilots returning from combat in crippled planes still faced one final hazard, the deck itself. By 1944, the Japanese Air Force was all but destroyed. Japanese flyers volunteered for suicide missions. Called kamikaze, they were sworn to crash their planes into American ships. The Japanese pilots were determined to die. The American defenders were equally determined to live. In one massive battle in June 1944, American gunners shot down over 400 enemy planes. They called it the Marianas Turkey Shoot.
1945, the sound of gunfire faded as the war came to an end. And a new generation of bigger, more powerful aircraft carriers came into being. Today, they are floating fortresses, the largest warships ever built, capable of carrying and launching a bewildering array of airborne weapons. No ship in history has ever packed more power than a modern aircraft carrier. Commanders and crew alike know that their $2 billion ship is better defended than any other vessel at sea. But to defend against attack, an enormous task force must be deployed. Helicopters shield against submarines by penetrating deep below the surface with sensitive sonar devices. To complete the ring of protection, computerized missile launchers can create a curtain of explosive steel. To destroy incoming missiles, gunships now rely on a weapon called Phalanx. It automatically locates and tracks its target, then unleashes a barrage of lethal fire. Such formidable defenses make the aircraft carrier the mightiest warship ever built. Yet, Ironically, the threat it must defend against most forcefully is what made it possible. Aerial warfare. When angered, the male sea elephant inflates its nose until it is over 20 inches long. Believe it or not. Her name was Renee Vivian. She was a poet of delicious sensibilities. She lived in Paris at the turn of the century in an exotic apartment like this. As a poet and an incurable romantic, Renee Vivian was obsessed with three things. The perfect poem, the perfect life, and the perfect death. Motivated, perhaps, by a depression following a shattered love affair, she decided to make the perfect death her final aesthetic statement. She believed that the fragrance of flowers, especially lilies like these, could be fatal. So to create her own perfect funeral wreath, she gathered a huge bouquet of lilies and proceeded to arrange herself and the flowers into an appropriate display. Renee placed her head in the middle of the flowers. She had hoped to suffocate herself with the sweet smell of the lilies while she was asleep. However, the attempt was far from fatal. She awoke the next morning with no harm done, except for a slight headache. She went on to live her perfect life, to write her poems that are still quoted as models of perfection, and ultimately to die of perfectly natural causes. Since Renee's time, some ideas about art have changed. In the Soho district of New York City, 
Artists like Eric Stoller experiment with new creative forms. Stoller is a sculptor. Instead of using clay or stone, he works with electrical wiring, sockets, and thousands of light bulbs, each of which has been hand-painted. A Stoller creation is not complete until he turns the power on and the lights begin to shimmer and move. Stoller calls this cascading, endlessly repeating work perpetual motion machine. I think what appeals to me about light is that it's ephemeral, it's elusive, it's there but it's not there. It's very, it can be very liquid and um, I can make something materialize or dematerialize depending on how I use the light. Artists often try to transform things taken from ordinary life. For Stoller, this meant spending five months covering his car with 1,659 individually installed light bulbs. To produce the electricity he needs, he installed an extra generator. A computer allows him to alternate among 23 different patterns. The final result, for a while at least, is very fulfilling. A photographer as well as a sculptor, Stoller doesn't use just electric lights to make art. Ten years ago, he had what he calls an inspired accident with a fireworks sparkler and a camera. He realized he'd discovered a new way to take pictures. Stoller sets the lens to remain open so the camera will record every move he makes with the sparklers. Because he stays in the shadows and keeps moving, his image will not be a part of the finished picture. Although it will not be apparent until the photograph is developed and printed, Stoller is painting with light. Now he closes the lens. Some call Stoller's photographs frozen fireworks. Motion is caught and made solid without losing its fluid grace. In this photograph, Stoller features himself. The artist has become part of the picture. In Boston, the Transit Authority has decided commuters deserve the opportunity to look at something besides graffiti and wall posters. On their way to trains at the South Station, travelers pass by an unusual sculpture called Wheels in Motion. Made of stainless steel and pure gold, it was formed by a violent explosion. The artist works in rural New Hampshire. Born in Italy, Silva Nacenci has earned an international reputation with her work, which begins quietly enough. Here in New Hampshire, they call me the dynamite lady. Many people think that every time when I do one big explosion, my septic tank blew up. <laughs> but uh, it's only dangerous if you don't do it by the rules. The blast has to be set off well clear of any buildings.
Sand will absorb some of the shock, but stray grains must be brushed away. Otherwise, they'll leave deep scratches when the blast occurs. Unlike most artists, Chen Chi wants to be well clear of her work at the moment of creation. She uses an electrical detonating system, a blasting cap, and about 75 feet of wire. When she first applied to use the explosives for artistic purposes, Chen Chi was investigated by the FBI, but they soon gave her their approval. The final moment is always one of creative anticipation. It takes time to prepare for a piece, but it takes only one second to form it. And that's why it's very appealing to me. I find it explosive. It serves all my purposes quite well. I can produce very large pieces with very little labor. Chen Chi finishes the piece by coating parts of it with liquid gold. She calls this work birth. Most gardeners are faced with the same problem every day, to water, or not to water? That is the question. In France, some scientists have come up with a novel way to get an answer. In the orchards of Avignon, agriculture has been combined with electronics. By attaching delicate sensing devices to a few trees, scientists can provide lemons with a way to tell growers when or if they need water. The device measures minute changes in the size of the lemon and transmits the information to technicians stationed at computers that monitor the entire orchard. The computers are programmed to transform the reactions of the lemon into words. In French or English, the message is clear. To respond to the request, the operator simply taps a few keys. The growth is virtually invisible, but the message sent by the lemon is unmistakable. The computer takes the guesswork out of watering by letting the lemon speak for itself. Believe it or not. us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.